glad you're here today, whether you're with us on Zoom or uh, live stream. I'm just really glad to have you here. Uh, today, we're going to continue on with the lessons in Colossians. Today, it's Colossians 2, 13 through 23. And the title is, Let No One Imprison You with Legalism. Starting uh, at, verse 20, at verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that is against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I read a, a, a little item called Forsaking the World, and it says this, I'm in, er in earnest about forsaking the world and following Christ, but I am puzzled about worldly things. What is it I must forsake, a young man uh, asked? Colored clothes, for one thing. Get rid of everything in your wardrobe that's not white. Stop sleeping on a soft pillow. Sell your musical instruments and don't eat any uh white any white bread if you're sincere about obeying christ you cannot take warm baths or shave your beard <laughs> to shave is to lie against him who created us and attempt to improve his work <laughs> elizabeth elliott commented on the above dialogue does this answer sound absurd it's the answer given in most uh in the most celebrated christian schools of the second century. Is it possible that the rules that have been adopted by many 20th century Christians will sound as absurd to earnest followers of Christ a few years hence? And that was Elizabeth Elliot in a book called The Liberty of Obedience. The point is that rules not set down by God are of men and they are constitute legalism we have to be careful to live in the freedom of christ without making rules of men that enslave people and actually deny salvation by grace galatians 2 4 says this matter arose because some false brethren had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in christ jesus and to make us slaves that's still going on today folks galatians 5 1 it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burned again by a yoke of slavery. You know, uh, be very careful because there are many traps out there that will end up stealing your prize if you allow it. There are traps like the trap I talked about in the last study of empty ideas that are not biblical. There's also the trap of straight ahead legalism. The Jews themselves had fallen into a trap and Jesus Christ was continually rebuking the religious leaders of Israel for, the hypo for their hypocrisy and legalism. Regarding Pharisaic laws, in contrast to the two commands of Christ to love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself, the Pharisees had developed a system of 613 laws 365 negative commands and 248 positive laws. By the time Christ came, it had produced a heartless, cold, and arrogant brand of righteousness. As such, it contained at least 10 tragic flaws. And here they are. New laws continually need to be invented for new situations. Accountability to God is replaced by accountability to men. Hmm. It reduces a person's ability to discern personally. It creates a judgmental spirit. The Pharisees confused uh, personal preferences with divine law. It produces inconsistencies. 
It created a false standard of righteousness. It became a burden to the Jews. It was strictly external, and it was rejected by Christ. But Paul writes, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having concealed the written code with its, uh, have, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. This means that Christ canceled our obligation to keep all the laws of the Jews and has written the law of Christ, the law of grace, on our hearts. Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on our heart, on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing and now defending them. So the law of Christ is now written in the hearts of those who believe and are born again. Christ disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You know, this is often used in reference to demonic authorities who do play a part in spreading legalism, but in context, it's directly addressing the human authorities in Judaism who were the lawyers of the law. They had added, the, uh, they had added all kinds of requirements that God had never required. And in so doing, had made the law itself ungodly. God will not, not write those added regulations on the hearts of Jews and Gentiles, but his, his commandments, the Ten Commandments, for instance, but especially the two that sum it up, Luke 10, 26 through 28. What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replies, do, replied, do this, and you will live. But there are those false teachers, just as a Jewish religious elite in Jesus' day, who want to enslave people in regulations. Going on in the text, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come, and, and uh, the reality, however, is found in Christ. The word therefore means that we have to look back and see what came before. Because Christ took away the law, nailing it to the cross, and writing his law in our hearts, don't let anyone try to tie you down with ungodly re regulations, such as what you eat, drink, what festivals you attend, what day of the week you worship, etc. You know, there are many cults that do this, and many churches that have yet to be designated as a cult, but who should have been due to their uh, what they're doing and teaching. Today, for instance, the SDA tried to enslave people by telling them uh, they can only worship on Saturday, not eat meat, etc. The Catholics enslave people by telling them they have to follow certain rituals to be saved. Word of faith and uh, uh, third-wave false teachers claim you have to have a second baptism and they'll give it to you by the laying out of hands, and then they and then, of course, you must speak in tongues to prove that you have the Holy Spirit. Uh, all the world's false religions have regulations they put on their followers that have nothing to do with, with what God requires. The reality of what is required for obedience to Christ is found in Christ. That is grace. We are to love one another, love our neighbor 
and most of all, love Jesus Christ. Out of love for Christ, all things follow. Going on in the text, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. As in the days of Paul, many teachers today delight in false humility. When I think about that, I remember Tommy Tenney, a false heretic, oneness Pentecostal, who made a big show out of going on TV, TBN, and washing the feet of John Arnott of the Toronto Blessing and Paul Crouch of TBN and many others. But this was a big show in order for them to accept him, even though he teaches that God is not triune. And you know what? It worked. They all accepted him. Benny Hinn walks on stage in a white suit, the utter focus of attention in his crusade, then claims to be bringing glory to God. Mm, who's the glory going to? Remind me again. That's false humility, folks. TBN false teachers claim to be giving money to the poor while they are becoming rich. And they brag about their giving in front of millions of people in order to look humble. This is the way it is over and over again. In Paul's time, there were also people teaching Christians to worship angels. You know, that's still a common practice today. The Jehovah's Witness, for instance, claimed that Jesus Christ is really the archangel Michael. The Catholic Church worships dead saints and angels. One of the biggest, biggest problems we have today is the third point by Paul. He says such a person goes into great detail about what he's seeing and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. Oh, wow, did he ever say it there? The problem is seeing angels with Jesus Christ or God or whatever, and then coming up with a big story about a vision they saw to make people think they're super holy is what's going on today all over the place. But it's a very old problem and it continues to be one today. We have millions of Christians being taught to pass around stories of visions and dreams when often it can be proven by comparing what they say to the Bible that they're going into detail about things that their unspiritual mind is made up with idle notions or even demonic visions that they've had. People are quick to pass around a bunch of stuff these days without ever vetting it. They never check it out to see if it's true or not. Oh, so-and-so raised the dead, you know, blah, 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 and all this stuff. So-and-so saw Jesus come into his bedroom. This problem, problem actually goes all the way back to the Old Testament. We read in Jeremiah 14, 14, Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are, number one, prophesying to you false visions, number two, divinations, number three, idolatries, and number four, the delusions of their own minds. I really like that verse. That basically says it all. I want about to be clear about this issue from a biblical perspective. Paul says that people who do these things have, quote, lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God uh, causes it to grow. So this is serious business. I've seen many people lose their connection to Christ and his body by claiming they have a special revelation of angels, that they have special rules given them to them by God, and that they are humble when they're actually full of pride. So be careful of false humility. Often I've seen people like this take control of churches because they're the ones who at, at least claim they spend many hours fasting and praying. Oh, I've seen this one over and over again. They come into your church and they start having these prayer groups. And everybody thinks, wow, these guys are really holy. 
But you know what? That's it's a ploy to get people to listen to them and their visions and dreams, which are almost always a delusion of their minds. Be careful of people who come off as having a religious spirit, but are leading you into false teaching and false prophecy. It's a big way they hook people today. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of the world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all designed, uh, destined to perish with use because they're based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom for their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Boy, what a statement. You know, if you're buried in Christ and have nailed your sins to the cross with him, why are you continuing to submit to worldly rules? Now, this is not talking to submitting to the rules of an orderly society, which we need to do. This is talking about religious rules that are supposed to make you holy. All these kinds of religious rules and substitute for the grace of God are useless and will pass away. They're destined to fade away, as in my opening example of second century school rules. We need to follow everlasting rules set down by Jesus Christ, written in the wor world, written in the word and on our hearts through the Spirit. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Human regulations, religious regulations, appeal to our human nature because we always want to find a way to save ourselves without God. <laughs> yep. That's one of the big things with people. We tend to either toward legalism or liberalism. But you know what? Those things that we try to do to save ourselves, they don't work. They're not wise at all, but they're foolish. Quote, with their self-imposed worship. We think we are worshiping God with these things, but really it's self-imposed worship. Worship that God is not asked for or required. In fact, it leads us away from Christ. So be careful of those who require these regulations because of their, quote, false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. The fact is that their harsh code, they, you know, is that they can't even keep their own harsh code. It doesn't work. In fact, you'll, you'll often find that they, uh, quote, lack any value in restraining sensual uh, indulgence. It's been my long experience that those who impose strict legalism in the churches have the most problems in their churches with issues of sin. This is because our spirits are meant to be, belong to Christ, not to legalism. And under any form of legalistic law, we always end up rebelling, and especially the leaders who teach these things. This is why we see so much sexual immorality among those kinds of churches and other sinful problems. They end up rebelling against the Lord because they're adhering to a set of rules that God has not required. The Lord wants us to live in Christ, in the law of Christ. Mm -hmm.